All right, good morning, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> so far, over the last approximately four weeks, we have studied the state of affairs in the Middle East, starting from the immediate post-World War II period. So if we just quickly go back and see what we have talked about, I mean, the, the fundamental stones on the way from 1945 to the present day, we have covered a period starting, I mean, we put our yardstick here in 1945. And of course, we being here at the moment, we are not there yet. We started from here, we covered the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and we are going to cover starting from 1990s. And many things have changed, especially with one major development in the year 1990. So far, I mean, we talk about the, of course, uh, fundamental developments, major developments in the Middle East. First being, um, well, maybe was not of that great significance when compared to some other you know, developments that have taken place in due course from 1945 and onwards. But the creation of the Arab League or League of Arab Nations was an important development after all. And in the, we have seen, of course, there is this 1948, which is the proclamation, yes, creation of the State of Israel or proclamation of independence, sovereignty, of the State of Israel. Then we have here, uh, of course, there is this war between Israel and Arab nations, and the Nasser period, of course, uh, which had an impact since mid-1950s until uh, late 60s and 70s. And of course, we have here, uh, what are the major developments? Can you just say something here in the 50s? In the 50s. Great, Fatih Chalkan says, yes, this is Suez Canal crisis. And in the 60s, we have, of course, the 67 war, or the June war, or Six Days War, whichever you prefer. In the 70s, we have also a number of other major developments, such as what happened in the 70s. Yes, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Well, these are, of course, uh, very few major developments out of a large number of, uh, again, still significant developments in the Middle East. There are, of course, uh, some changes in the regimes, especially that follow the wars between Israel and Arab nations. Um, and when we come to the 80s, what do we see, especially the end of 1970s? One, again, Iranian Revolution, perfect. So, Yom Kippur, um, June War, Iranian Revolution, etc. And in the 70s, again in the 80s, we have, of course, uh, Saddam as well as uh, Assad or Assad in power, again Iran, another factor, and major developments taking place. That all of them bring us to the point where we are going to talk about today more extensively, and, and one major development shocked the world, which was? The end of Cold War. The end of Cold War. Well, that was uh, one, of course, 1990. the 1990 had a huge impact on the rest of the world, including my life as well, because I came to Ankara for the first time and stayed ever since, and look forward to going back to Istanbul. All right, um, so the end of Cold War, this is one major development. There is no question about it. And if we confine ourselves more specifically to the Middle East, what do we see? Something happened in the year 1990, which was? 
Well, before the war, there was something else, which was, yeah, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. On August 2nd, Iraqi troops have crossed the border into Kuwaiti territory. So, of course, that was something which was not at all acceptable for, uh, for the rest of the world, for the free world. And I'll try to, oops, uh, I'll try to show you here, um, well, we are encountering some difficulties in getting some of these resolutions here. Yes, this is, yeah, this is resolution 1660. Can you see? Uh, let me just have this like here. Of course, on the day Iraq invaded Kuwait, the United Nations Security Council uh, convened a meeting, an emergency meeting, and of course uh, evaluated the situation and right after that uh, issued that resolution, that declaration actually to the world saying that, determining that there exists a breach of international peace and security as, as regards the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and acting under articles 39 and 40 of the Charter of the United Nations well, this is, uh, these are articles uh, from chapter 7. And trusting that you have uh, at least fundamental knowledge, basic knowledge about the United Nations Charter and chapters, I'll elaborate these issues a little bit uh, more um, in a moment. And of course, acting on the articles 39 and 40, Make, making direct reference to these articles has, of course, a reason, and a, a reason that I will explain in a moment, meaning that uh, the actions that the United Nations Security Council or decision that the United Nations Security Council may take may involve actions that will, of course, that may involve use of force. Because use of force is uh, forbidden by the United Nations Charter with a couple of exceptions. And that was actually the principle on which the whole United Nations system uh, was based. And I'll again talk about this issue uh, in a moment. And it condemned the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. That is, it did not accept, uh, uh, and it did not just turn a blind eye. Well, because there were some developments in other parts of the world before and after, and the United Nations Security Council was blamed for not taking proper action abruptly or just promptly. Um, and not even condemning uh, the developments, but of course the, the, the conjunctural developments uh, had an impact on, on that kind of uh, behavior. Well, well, we'll talk about uh, again in detail. And demand that Iraq withdraw uh, immediately and conditionally all its forces to the position which they were. So um, on the day Iraqi forces crossed the border into the um, Ir Kuwaiti territory, the United Nations condemned the act and f considered this as an act of aggression because making direct reference to Article 39 uh, suggests that it, uh, it, f it considers this an act of aggression. Again, considering this as a, an, an act of aggression is important because without defining whether this is an act of aggression or not, the United Nations Security Council cannot take decisions with respect to authorization of use of force uh, to a group of countries or coalition of forces. And called upon Iraq to begin immediately um, intensive negotiations, which actually was the case. Iraq and uh, Iraqi representatives and, and, and other countries have met in different uh, fora, in different places, they, they negotiated the situation. Of course, the position of the United Nations and the free world, the rest of the world was clear. The message was clear here. Withdraw your troops immediately. This is not an act, uh, this is an unacceptable act. This is an act of aggression. And if you don't uh, withdraw, you will, of course, have to suffer the consequences. As you can see here, uh, this is, by the way, Resolution 661 the second resolution after the first one, on the, which was issued on the first, on the day of uh, invasion. And a few days later, just four days later, the United Nations Security Council took the second in the series of many other developments that follow up until the late 1990s. 
uh, and again here made much clearer, much more explicit reference to acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. What does this tell you? I mean, now your students, uh, junior students, senior students, I mean third year, fourth year students, and um, you must have taken already international law and international organizations courses. And at least you must be taken right now and it's already about a month since the beginning of the semester. What does this clear reference to uh, Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter uh, tell you? What is, what is its significance? I just said something, but can you elaborate a little bit more? Does it ring a bell? Does it? No? Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. All right, let's try to figure oops again. Sorry for that. Um, well, as you can see here, this is Chapter s s uh, 6. It talks about Pacific settlement of disputes, meaning Pacific means, you know, peaceful uh, or measures other than meter measures. And uh, so if there is a reference to chapter 6, that you should understand that diplomacy will be used as a, as a tool in the reconciliation of uh, the differences of the dispute between or among the parties. So Pacific Settlement of Disputes uh, envisage using uh, the merits of diplomacy, mediation, arbitration, and, and other institutional frameworks with a view to solving the problem. And if there is a, a reference to Chapter 7, as the title uh, suggests here, action with respect to the threats to peace, breaches of the peace, and acts of aggression. So that means we are talking about a security situation. There is, uh, there is a threat. Well, of course, for Chapter 7 to be in force, uh, it does. I mean, it, it is not necessary for something to have happened already. The the mere threat of something that that, that may happen in the future or in the or something is imminent, then the United Nations Security Council should also sit and consider the situation with a view to uh, taking necessary precautions to prevent such an occurrence. So this should remind you the very subject of your simulation. Remember, in the simulation. Uh, uh, subject I wrote down here, emergency meeting to be convened uh, and presided over by the UN Secretary General with a view to discussing the security situation in the Middle East with particular emphasis on Iran's nuclear program and the concerns of regional countries about the possible course of action that may be taken against Iran by Israel and or United States. So there is a threat that the United Nations Security Council, sorry, uh, Secretary General uh, anticipates and, and, and he, he makes a threat assessment. He looks at uh, the world, he con in, in maybe as a result of consultations with the delegations uh, uh, from Middle Eastern uh, region, then he concludes that unless certain actions are taken, the uh, United States and Israel may you know, launch an attack against Iran and therefore he convinced this meeting and this is going to be the subject of your simulation. So each country delegation must make necessary precautions to make necessary statements during the simulation. This point has to be properly understood and this is something that will be considered within the context of chapter 7. So threats to peace, breaches of the peace and that means breach has already occurred, violation of borders for instance of a country has taken place or an, ag an act of aggression is uh, also something that has taken place. Therefore, uh, this, is, this is a chapter which deals with this kind of situations. And this is therefore one of the most significant uh, chapters in the United Nations Charter. Of course, the entire charter, I mean every single word makes sense and has a weight uh, f starting from the preambular sections, which uh, declares, which you know, explains the basic principles of the uh, Charter, I mean, uh, of the United Nations purposes and principles here, and there are certain other uh, sort of chapters dealing with uh, 
the powers of the Security Council, for instance, the powers of the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, the General Assembly, etc. But this one, Chapter 7, is one which has been, uh, of course, subject to uh, many discussions, many analyses uh, in, in, in this context. Um, let me just go into this a little bit and see what is written here. Article 39, just remember that uh, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 660, which was uh, issued on the day of invasion here, uh, in the UN Resolution 660 made reference, direct reference to Article 39 and Article 40. So let's go, let's read what, what is written here. The Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to peace, to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, and shall make recommendations or decide what measures shall be taken in accordance with Articles 41, 42, to maintain and restore or restore international peace and security. Well, this is something that is of utmost importance. And I will explain the reason why making direct reference to Article 39 here makes sense, or not making direct reference to Article 39 also um, says a lot. For instance, during the uh, Yugoslavia crisis or the Yugoslav uh, war, the Balkan Wars, the United Nations Security Council was not able to make direct reference to Article 39 which, of course, blocked the way or uh, prevented the, uh, the rest of the world from uh, stopping atrocities uh, in the Balkans. And many people were uh, killed in the hands of the uh, fighting parties, the Serbs, uh, etc. So, uh, Article 39 makes reference, a clear reference to the act of aggression. And without making reference to this, it is not possible for the United Nations Security Council to to take such measures that would, including others, of course, that would uh, include uh, the use of force. Because here it says the maintaining or restoring international peace and security. This is one particular um, principle, one particular duty of the United Nations Security Council and the United Nations system as a whole. Because we should remember that there was, of course, another such institution which was created in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, or World War I, which was the League of Nations. The League of Nations uh, rested upon the principle that states would be better off if they did not fight, but rather try to solve their differences through diplomacy, th through political uh, instruments, economic instruments, etc., because they had just very recently uh, experienced the uh, a high number of casualties, there were uh, massacres, there were a large number of people who were killed by chemical weapons, so many people were dislocated, so millions of people lost their lives during the World War I. So the statesmen, the politicians, diplomats, scholars, intellectuals, all who had any bit of consciousness sort of made references to the need for establishing an institution, an international body, by means of which the you know, differences between states or uh, the um, competing cl claims of states could be uh, somehow resolved through mediation, diplomacy, arbitration. And the League of Nations was established and worked well pretty much. Well, uh, in some respect worked to the disadvantage of Turks because uh, the League of, League of Nations had a very negative role in uh, Turkey's losing uh, Mosul, but regardless of all this, uh, eventually Turkey became part of the League of Nations system. But the League of Nations uh, lacked something that was very, very essential. The League of Nations had almost a similar uh, structure, uh, institutional framework. It, it had a covenant, which was the charter of the League of Nations, and it also had a council, uh, which also was composed of a number of countries, but they did not have any power to veto, unlike the United Nations Security Council's permanent members today. Yet the, uh, the, the system was established to uh, provide the necessary mediation tools, diplomacy, 
uh, and, and political initiatives, whatever, that would be necessary to solve the problems. But it lacked something very important. Like many people say, it didn't have a suit, I mean, to bite. It could not uh, hurt uh, the ones who committed act of aggression. It had a certain norms, principles in place. There were some, uh, of course, uh, 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 chapters or articles which would necessitate use of diplomacy, which would suggest use of diplomacy instead of fighting. But uh, the, 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 the League of Nations did not have uh, enough power to enforce its decisions. And that was seen especially when uh, Italy uh, invaded Ethiopia and there was this war, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. In neither cases, the League of Nations uh, could take any uh, uh, measure, actually took decisions, but it was not capable of enforcing its decisions. And in the case of Lib uh, uh, Italy, for instance, Italy under Mussolini threatened all countries which would impose sanctions as was suggested by the uh, uh, resolutions of the League of Nations uh, and threatened these countries with counter uh, action with retaliation. So the League of Nations, which in principle rested upon this principle of collective security, could not put this principle in practice. So uh, having seen especially Italy's uh, invasion of Ethiopia and, and, and Japanese invasion of Manchuria, as well as uh, the rearmament of the uh, German uh, army under uh, Hitler or Nazi Germany, all these developments could not be prevented by the League of Nations, which, of course, paid, paved the way to the World War II, and after which the League of Nations system collapsed, and in return for which there was this United Nations system. And the United Nations system was discussed during the war, not right after the war. It was discussed throughout the war, and, and, and those who have drawn some lessons from the League of Nations experience wanted to create a much more effective body, something that could be more effective in case there would be an act of aggression. Because, uh, and again, the very same principle of collective security was adopted by the United Nations uh, Charter. And according to the Charter, uh, it was so believed that if all countries would display their resolve to prevent a few countries, one or more countries, uh, from uh, using force against their neighbors or against other countries with a view to achieving their objectives. If, if the rest of the world would just stand up against such an act of aggression, either these countries would be deterred from you know, pursuing their ambitions, or even if they, in deterrence failed and they committed a certain act of aggression, they would be punished which would set a precedent and example for others. And then that would deter the future act of, acts of aggression. So therefore, the United Nations Security Council, again, rested upon the principle of collective security, and that uh, the security for one, also security for all, against the uh, aggressors. For that to happen, of course, uh, this chapter, as we'll go down, uh, we'll see in, in, in the following articles, from, uh, starting from Article 39. One major thing was important, definition of act of aggression. Because if there is an act of aggression, then you uh, sort of commit yourself to eliminate it, or at least to uh, you know, make the one who committed that act of aggression pay uh, the consequences dearly. So. This reference to Article 39 and Article 40, which is uh, in order to prevent an act, an aggravation of the situation, Security Council may, before making the recommendation of deciding upon measures provided for in Article 39, call upon parties concerned. So to take such measures that may lead to uh, the authorization of uh, and use of uh, force. So uh, this. Uh, Again, this, this uh, article is extremely important, and without making a reference to this, no further action can be taken. And uh, there were uh, situations, especially during the Cold War years, when the United Nations Security Council could not agree upon, could not 
developed consensus as to whether there was an act of aggression. I mean, throughout the Cold War years, because there was this, this more or less bipolar system, the uh, Eastern world, Western world, and the Third world, and uh, because uh, the United Nations Security Council is composed of now 15 countries, uh, and five of which have veto power, and one of uh, them, if, they, if that particular country, whichever country it might be, vetoed a decision, no decision would be taken. So therefore, it was extremely important for the United Nations Security Council uh, uh, members, especially the, the uh, permanent members, to come to a consensus, or at least uh, one of, I mean, those who had veto power not to veto a decision, but during the Cold War years, because, for instance, in some cases, uh, the Soviet Union vetoed or cast its veto power, used its veto power to stop uh, a uh, resolution from being adopted, or uh, China, in some cases, or United States, or France, or United Kingdom. So, therefore, it was not possible until such time to agree upon a country's act of aggression which would eventually uh, uh, pave the way to the uh, authorization of use of force. Again, why am I making so much reference to the authorization of use of force? Because um, just like it was the case in the League of Nations Covenant, and, and the same principle was also adopted in the United Nations Charter, which, was, which in a sense outlawed the use of force. Use of force is illegal, the Charter says. But there are basically two exceptions. One of which, of course, the, the uh, use of force for protecting yourself, self-defense. As you can see here, and uh, there are some, of course, limitations to that as well. It's not an extensive right. For instance, nothing in the present Charter shall impair the in inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until this point is important, until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security, and measures taken by members, of, uh, by members in the exercise of this right of self-defense shall be immediately reported to the Security Council and shall not in any way affect the authority and responsibility of the Security Council under the present Charter to take any time such action as it deems necessary in order to maintain or restore international peace and security. Well, um, the summary of what is said here is a long one, of course, but diplomatic statements or sentences may have to include certain things so that uh, uh, there should be no disagreement as to what is exactly meant there, or, or there should not be different interpretations of what is written here. Because this is always the case with text of international documents or agreements, one of the parties may have a different interpretation of what may have been put there in the text. So therefore, diplomats must negotiate this uh, uh, very carefully, and therefore negotiations of international treaties, agreements, co conventions, and things like that take a lot of time, sometimes decades, not even years. So, therefore, it says here that, of course, members of the United Nations have their inherent, something that is in, in their, in their you know, uh, presence, in their uh, very being. It is, not, it is an unalienable right. They don't need to get this authorization from anybody. You do not wait until someone to tell you to protect yourself. You just have this right without getting permission from anybody you have the right to protect yourself, and if you are uh, against an act of aggression, if you are sort of, uh, if somebody attacks you, then you have the right to use force against the aggressor, but it says until such time, the United Nations Security Council seizes the matter, I mean, takes control of the matter. So, therefore, an, an attack against a country does not give that country which is attacked uh, which is being attacked by another country to use force against the country which, which attacked that country uh, to use force against it uh, without any limit. There is some limit to even self-defense, uh, defending yourself because your self-defense act may go beyond certain limits, it may, may go beyond your anticipation and may cause other troubles for, for the region, for that country, 
for your own people and for the rest of the world. So therefore, you have the right to defend yourself and of course, the United Nations Security Council will take necessary measures from a certain point onwards. And since then, and starting from that point on, you also have to observe the decisions of the United Nations Security Council because you are now part of the system. So these things I mean, uh, are things that you should bear in mind, you should uh, definitely uh, remember. Well, what happened uh, during this, uh, or following the, um, Yes, following the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, as I said, the uh, United Nations Security Council took a number of decisions and uh, passed a certain, uh, uh, certain resolutions which had a number of, uh, which incorporated a number of decisions. By the way, uh, just something that, should, that you should keep in your mind at all times if you are going to deal with uh, United Nations related issues. I mean, if one day you may become an analyst, uh, someone who works for an international organization, uh, a think tank, or maybe a professor. So what you have to bear in mind, of course, every single uh, paragraph of every single United Nations Security Council resolutions are important. But if you don't have time, because sometimes uh, these uh, decisions or resolutions are not that short, Sometimes we have 15-page, 20-page long resolutions. And if you have um, very few time, a little time to make a comment, you have to go directly to the paragraphs which start with decides. Because, of course, all other paragraphs are all equally important, but when you go to the paragraphs which start with decides, you, of course, get information about what kind of decisions the United Nations Security Council has taken, because these decisions have to be implemented by all members of the United Nations system. If a country is a member of the UN, it has to observe the decisions taken by the United Nations Security Council. Of course, this is something that tells us the major difference between the United Nations Security Council and also the United Nations General Assembly. You might have seen on many uh, occasions that there are also resolutions issued by the United Nations General Assembly. And, and the, the major difference between the UN General Assembly resolutions and United Nations Security Council resolutions is that the United Nations General Assembly resolutions do not have binding power. They do not bind countries. They do not sort of compel the states, the member states to you know, do something. These the resolutions, of course, are important, and we have seen how significant they may be uh, during the Korean War, when the United Nations Security Council was blocked because of the uh, membership of China, where there was this uh, revolution, uh, which China would represent, uh, would be represented at the United Nations Security Council, was the key issue during the uh, Korean War, but still a decision had to be taken and because of the blockage at the UN Security Council, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution, Uniting for Peace Resolution, uh, you know, paved the way to um, the intervention of the United States and other countries, including Turkey, uh, uh, in the peninsula. And, you know, this, uh, the war between 1950 and 1953, uh, which is still, uh, uh, not finished. There is still not a peace agreement. There is still a ceasefire uh, in force. And therefore, that was uh, how UN Sec General Assembly resolution could be significant. We can understand from that. But in, uh, in, in all other instances, we have seen the United Nations Security Council decisions to make a difference. And these, therefore, are uh, important. And the UN Security Council decisions have binding power they have to be enforced by all the members of the United Nations. But of course, there are certain uh, uh, exceptions to this. And if a country uh, uh, considers that implementing the United Nations Security Council decisions will cause damage to its vital interests and will cause harm to its vital interests, then it can consult the matter with the UN Security Council, which was the case, for instance, for Jordan uh, during the Iraq war. Uh, 
or during the sanctions that were applied uh, to Iraq uh, because of this uh, invasion. So uh, what we have seen here uh, in Resolution 60, the first one, uh, 61, and onwards, we have seen a, a long uh, sort of process of negotiations between Iraqis, uh, I mean Saddam's representatives, uh, in various platforms, of course, within the body of the United Nations, um, in Geneva, for instance, where, which is the headquarters of the League of Nations, and today uh, the League of Nations building is being used as the United Nations offices in Geneva. Uh, these nego negotiations took place in Geneva as well as in New York and in other places between the major countries of the UN system and also Iraq. But, um, of course, uh, the United Nations Security Council does not go to the very last sort of measure in terms of restoring peace and security because there are some interim measures between today, no action, and the last sort of measure, which is a use of force. In the meantime, there are some other instruments, economic instruments, political diplomatic instruments. As I said, political diplomatic instruments were used, uh, and that was negotiations and, and with, with a view to uh, persuading or convincing uh, Iraq that it would not be in their best interest to stay in Kuwaiti territory that they had to withdraw. So the, uh, the United Nations, uh, uh, other members of the UN did not negotiate with Iraq just to you know, you know, make a deal or, or cut a deal uh, over the territories of Kuwait. The position of the rest of the world was clear, as has been explained here in, in 660 and 661. The outright withdrawal of Iraqi forces. There was no concessions to be made, and the only purpose of negotiation was to convince Iraq that it would be in their best interest if they withdrew from Iraq. So that was clear. And also, in the meantime, there were some other measures such as, what kind of measure you can think of? I mean, war or using force is one, and this is the ultimate measure that the UN Security Council would like to resort to. And there is this political negotiations. So what else? Embargo. Yes, embargo, economic sanctions, and, and other type of uh, measures, economic measures. Because you do not want to hurt people. So uh, I'm sorry, let's. Let, um, because war or use of force must definitely be the ultimate uh, way of uh, solving difference. As I said, the UN system rests upon this principle of uh, outlawing use of force. As I said, one exception was uh, the self-defense, and the other exception is according to uh, Article 2 of the UN Charter, which is the authorization of the United Nations Security Council. So there is actually no other way of legitimizing use of force. Legitimacy of use of force would be under two major conditions, one of which is self-defense, and the other is authorization of UN Security Council. Yes, sir. Uh, Excuse me. Are they? Mass effect, uh, weapons, uh, well, by the way, weapons of mass destruction are not weapons are not regarded as weapons by the uh, UN system either and they are also uh, illegitimate. So, uh, I mean, when I said you, there is limit to use of uh, arms, it's not in the types of or number of arms. I mean, for instance, you're attacked. A part of your country is, attack, is under attack. And uh, if that country, which is now attacked, which is being attacked by a neighboring country, for instance, takes this case and uses this as a pretext or for justification of a large-scale counterattack and goes all the way to, for instance, uh, invade the, con the territory of the country which has attacked first. So that, that is something that goes out of proportion and out of the um, uh, limits that could explain your uh, uh, use of force with a view to defending yourself. 
Defending yourself is something else, but benefiting from the situation for other purposes or exploiting the situation or abusing the situation is another thing. So United Nations Security Council says, if you're under attack, of course you don't have to wait for me to react first. You can defend yourself with proper measures, of course in a pro proportionate way. You, you defend your territory, you defend your citizens, you defend your security forces, but until such time I take, uh, I start considering the issue. And when I start taking measures, you should be part of the system. You cannot act alone as if we are not there for you. Okay, so this is what is somewhat limited in terms of self-defense. Otherwise, a country may very well, um, as I said, exploit the situation by way of going beyond uh, anticipation, beyond what is uh, what would be considered as a, a legitimate way of defending your own uh, assets, citizens, security forces, territory, etc. So, uh, as I said, two things. I mean, self-defense and UN authorization is important, and the United Nations Security Council. Let's go back to the charter here. Um, yes. Yeah. As you can see here, Article 41-42 talks about uh, uh, 43. There, there, there is this talk about measures that would persuade a country um, uh, to somehow maybe step back, back down, uh, and then you know, withdraw from positions if there was an invasion, and also go along with the decisions of the United Nations. Because sometimes, um, I mean, in the Iraqi case, of course, that was not the case. But a country may be under a military dictatorship, and that military dictator uh, may have you know, ambitions to gain more territories and, you know, uh, or just, uh, just like uh, Iraqi situation, Kuwait situation, but there may be some uh, developments within the country and the dictator may be toppled down and the new regime may want to go along with the decisions of the United Nations Security Council. So, therefore, I mean, if the UN Security Council authorized use of force from the very beginning, of course it would be an immature act. I mean, without resorting to other instruments, political instruments, economic instruments, in order to persuade the country which has committed an act of aggression to restore the situation, go to the you know, uh, situation you know, uh, ex ante, I mean, which was before all these acts of aggression happened, then if you don't give a chance to that country to restore the situation and use uh, an authorized use of force, then of course this will claim the lives of many, many people, thousands, tens of thousands, or maybe hundreds of thousands of people may get killed because of such a decision. So the UN system also, United Nations Security Council as well, should act with uh, a certain degree of uh, responsibility. So therefore, there were all these interim measures. For instance, here, Article 41, the Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions. So you see, UN Security Council, first of all, decided um, taking such measures without or short of use of force and such decisions that would still be effective in terms of uh, reversing the situation and causing or making the Iraqi leadership to think again and withdraw if, uh, if possible. So that was the first uh, step the United Nations Security Council um, decided, but of course, um, in due course, we have seen the impossibility of uh, persuading Saddam Hussein to withdraw, uh, withdraw from the Iraqi uh, Kuwaiti territory. Regardless, of all uh, initiatives taken by a number of countries, which they thought may have may have had a certain impact, a certain influence on Iraq. Even then, uh, even them, they failed, such as France, for instance. It had a certain degree of impact on Iraqi leadership. They also failed, and on the contrary, uh, they were really uh, aggravated, in a sense, by certain actions taken by Saddam Hussein. Uh, 
during this uh, crisis situation. And because France, from the beginning, was one such country which considered seriously using its veto to prevent uh, harsh economic measures, sanctions on Iraq. And because of certain actions of Saddam Hussein, they decided not to exercise their veto right, not to use their veto right. And again, when it came to later on to the authorization of use of force, again, France uh, seriously considered vetoing this decision because it would pave the way to an arms struggle between Iraq and, and the Western and other powers. But again, because of certain things that Saddam Hussein did, committed, France again decided not to use their veto right. So these were interesting moments during this crisis, which I was also closely uh, scrutinizing, closely uh, following, uh, because it was my first year in international relations after all these years in engineering studies. All right, let's give a break here, and we'll continue after the break with the rest of the story.